something to offer, the show that goes to the heart of people living their dreams. And we'll meet them in just a moment. <laughs> My guest today is a woman who has been very supportive of me in my journey in television. She likes to dig deep and make a difference. She is an Emmy Award winning writer and producer who forged a career in broadcast journalism by blending passion for investigation, re investigative reporting with a commitment to illuminate critical issues of the day. I actually took that from some um, writings that have been written about her before. She has produced and directed documentary uh, films on issues ranging from child obesity in America, gun control, U.S. space program, and so many more. In 2017, she wrote, directed, and produced an independent documentary film, The Nuns, The Priests, The Bombs, it is my pleasure to welcome producer, writer, and founder of the Helen Young Pro Helen Young Productions. Helen Young, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for inviting I me. Know, I know. I'm so happy because you've been working on your project a long time. You've assisted me in challenges around my project and my film, so I'm so happy to be able to share your journey. So, Helen, right away I wanted to ask, have you always you have this in, had this investigative quality about life, like digging into humanity and sharing the depths and degrees of what I call the truths in stories. And ha did you have any models in your life, like your parents, a teacher, somewhere where you got that? Or was that just who you came out of the womb being, somebody who was just curious about life? Well, uh, Anne Marie, as you may know, I spent more than 20 years in. Uh, television news and broadcast journalism. So, um, and a lot of that time was spent doing investigative work. I worked for two, um, for CBS and NBC News for, together for 20 years, and then beyond that in other venues. Uh, so I did have quite a grounding in investigative work. I used to work on a, a segment on local television called The Troubleshooter and we would uh, get into consumer problems. Mm -hmm. And I moved on from that to doing more heavy duty investigations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's the part of uh, journalism that I enjoy and covering the truth about things. Right, but I'm, I was asking you, in addition, did you get that from the get-go, where did that, did any of that come from anywhere else in your life or any of your parents or a teacher? Or when did you start probing? Like when did that pro probative mind or investigative mind start? I, I you know, haven't started before work. I mean, I am a truth seeker. I mean, I like to get to the bottom of things and find out for myself. And I think that kind of plays into this film that I did on nuclear weapons. I needed to find out for myself what the real story is, because having um, experienced what the basic um, policy is, you know, we see nuclear weapons as the weapons that protect us. Mm -hmm. And so what I discovered in making this film is that there's a tremendous amount of uh, information that shows that actually nuclear weapons are keeping us less safe than, than we think they are. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so I think as a truth seeker is what, um, is what really motivates me to do my work. All right, great. So, and then a quick question. If you could sit down, I mean, you've sat down with many people, you've done major breaking stories, we'll get into a couple of those things later. Um, who would you sit down with if you could speak to anyone in history, and who would it be, and what would you probably want to ask the first thing? If anybody you've never sat down with that you'd want to sit down with. Hmm, that, that's an interesting question. Um, Probably Mahatma Gandhi <laughs> and uh, his um, nonviolent resistance, um, you know, talking to him about, uh, or Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, mm -hmm. those are really giants uh, in, in history. Um, that's kind of uh, sort of plays into, again, with my film, because the, the main characters in The Nuns, The Priests, and The Bombs are people who are willing to. Um, put their lives on the line for their beliefs. Mm -hmm. They're willing to go to prison and even risk their lives because they believe that nuclear weapons um, are immoral and basically violate international humanitarian law. So I, you, those are the people that I mentioned, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, are, are kind of the, you know, the... They would the, be very great to sit down with, right, I'm sure. Right, right. And you'd walk away pretty 
a changed person, I think. You'd have mm -hmm. opened up some new space in your life, mm -hmm. probably compassion and more humanity. So we're going to take a moment for an offering, and when we return, um, Helen will share a little bit about, and she did already a little bit, but a little bit about more about her years in broadcast television, breaking stories, creating documentaries, and things that really shifted a lot of things in the world and, you know, laws and changes of um, ways we think about things that are happening to people that need to have a light shined on them. We'll see you in just a moment. So we're back with Helen Young. Helen, um, I wanted to ask you just about what was the criteria? Obviously, when you went to school, you chose some very interesting schools. What was your criteria to choose your sp your place of higher education? And I also found it interesting. I think you studied Russian studies and and language. So, which interestingly plays into lots of things. Fast forwarding to more some of the stories and things you work on because there's a lot with this that has to do with other countries. Um, so, and when did you know or did you know at that time that you wanted to be a journalist? Because I know there's a certain point, and my niece is much younger than we are, when she was thinking of journalism, but she went to an Ivy League school, but there was no journalism program, so you always had to take something else. So I wondered what, how you shaped your education, and then you, you can talk about your first big break, too, in terms of business? Well, um, actually, I'm a native New Yorker. I went to the Bronx High School of Science, and I did go to City College, which uh, at the time was uh, what my family could afford, actually. Mm -hmm. And I chose Russian, Russian language and literature, because there was, um, it was a defense language. It was, it was considered a defense language at that mm -hmm. time, and there was a lot of energy being put into people uh, learning Russian here. Mm -hmm. The Russians had put Sputnik up. Right, I was going to say, and, uh, so much and, they were And we were trying to pivotal. catch up. Yeah. So that was the choice. And actually, at Bronx Science, they taught Russian at that time. Um, and then later in graduate school, I did go to Columbia University mm -hmm. Graduate School and studied Russian and also studied in their International Affairs School, mm -hmm. the Russian Institute. So. Um, I've been interested in international affairs, and that sort of harkens back to this film that embraces uh, nu nuclear weapons and the issue of nuclear weapons. Because that is an international affair, right. like a scary international affair. It's great. Okay, perfect. Um, so your first break into media, like how did you get your first job, Did and kind of how did it move you forward? Well, you know, I was hired as a freelance writer back in 1979 when there was a transit strike in New York City. Oh, I <laughs> remember that strike. That's when everybody started wearing sneakers because right. we all walked everywhere. That was, I think it was 79. And I kind of parlayed that into a writing job at um, WCBS-TV in 1980 when Ronald Reagan and uh, Jimmy Carter were running mm -hmm. against each other for the presidency. And it, it was my love of writing and, and the written word, actually, mm -hmm. that got me into the news business. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really go to journalism school. I learned on the job, and I think that's kind of the best way uh, to learn. Um, was it uh, challenging as, I mean, I don't want to get a whole male women thing, but, you know, you broke in at the time when there was still, it was, I'm not this isn't still heavily male-oriented, but was it hard? Was it, did you have to, like, be, like, bet you know, not better, but more up because, you know how some. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'm betraying my age, but when I when I was working at um, CBS, you know, we had manual typewriters. Mm -hmm. We didn't we didn't even have um, computers at that time. Uh, yes, it was very male dominated, um, and there were a few w women. However, more recently, if you go into any newsroom, it's it's completely full of women, and yeah, that's that's that. really so gratifying to see. You know uh, that that women are um, in the news business. I wish there were more of them in positions of power. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't think we have. Uh, nearly enough executives in, in positions where they're making the, mm -hmm. the decisions. So I think we have a long way to go. But yeah, I'm sure it's, well, also in your business, it's always like there's always 
comp everybody's working together, but everybody's like trying to get their little piece of the pie, I think, in terms of stories. So I want to ask you this. You, you've spent so many years um, doing groundbreaking stories and documentaries, network television, CBS, NBC, MSNBC. You've worked with Al Roker Productions. Um, and you did so many um, documentaries, the one on child obesity, you've done ones on gun trafficking and something on, uh, I want to say something, meat practices with meat and big big news stories. I'm not going to get into them, but you've done, you know, uh, John F. Kennedy Jr., O.J. When you, uh, first off, when you're at, at a network, do you take the colonel in and say, this is the one I want to do? Or do they go, okay, Helen, this is what we want to do? And then how do you find a colonel, and then we'll get into it in this film after we take our next break, a kernel of a story or an essence that you go like, no. I mean, because you said you like, to, how does that work for you? How do you get the kernel and how do you think about how it's going to move, if you know what I mean? The kernel of the idea and then the, you get on the journey and of course it reveals itself and you, and you illuminate it and you make the story for us to illuminate people, educate them and reach them and affect the change. But how do you see that nugget and then get that that's that's a, that's really an interesting question, and I think so much of you know work uh, is intuitive a lot. You know, you you look at a story and you think, you know, what angle can I pursue here? Um, I I think that um, it it really comes down to experience, actually. Mm -hmm. But to get back to your uh, earlier question. Uh, in the news business, um, there there are multiple ways that uh, that stories are covered. Mm -hmm. You can be assigned a story, or you can be enterprising and and come up pitch with your story. with pitch a story and um, do it that way. I, I think that the basic element is to have kind of what they call the nose for news, <laughs> that you really are passionate about this and that if you have a passion for something, you will be driven to find the angle mm -hmm. to pursue. Yeah, because, I mean, you always see those stories about two people are kind of going after a same story and who right. ends up getting it is mm -hmm. perhaps the angle and what they brought to it, which is great. Um, is there, I'm going to ask this before we get the offering and break because it's on my mind, because you've done so many things. Have you ever in your work, because of some of the thing, the hard things you've investigated and put out there, ever felt any kind of threat to yourself or did any of the stories ever scare, you know what I mean, scare you in a way, not like parts of them doing them or when you saw something that you like really uncovered that seemed like a big more than you ever thought? Did you ever have any moments where you felt like, you know, fearful about like once the telling's out or I'm telling it and how's it going to affect? Uh, I, I think that um, w when I was working in the daily news business, I think there was a tremendous amount of support. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not quite sure, you know, what's going on these days. Of course, right now we're in the throes of this Jamal Khashoggi uh, murder. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a columnist for the Washington Post, right. and and we're finding out that he was basically killed. I mean, th this is a kind of chilling thing for people who are doing their job. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that. It, it, it just sends a message that uh, we're living in a world right now where the media is really being um, trashed and, mm -hmm. and just being uh, denigrated. And it, it's a sorry time and a sad time for people who are, whose job it is to shine a light on, on criminality or corruption. I, I have a tremendous amount of concern about this. Right, and everybody's saying everything's fake all the time and all this crazy. Right, yeah. It's, yeah. It, I mean, it's, not that some isn't, but it's, you know, you have to. I think the internet and, and, you know, the internet has created a whole new landscape. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times stuff gets thrown out there and we don't really know, you know, if it's valid or not valid. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's just the, the whole business has changed so rapidly that this is what we have right now, mm -hmm. and um, I think for the average person, sometimes it's difficult to know mm -hmm. what to believe. Right. But um, uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I sometimes wonder where where is it all going? 
I don't know, it's frightening to think about, but I think we should take an offering and get on to where this film goes. So okay. um, we're going to take a moment for an offering. When we return, we're going to have Helen share the evolution and the final culmination of the nuns, the priests, and the bombs. A terrific documentary, terrific in so many ways, but, you know, it really gets us to wake up and see what some people are willing to fight for and what we need to be aware of that's going on in the world and how we can have a voice too. We'll see you in just a moment. We're back with Helen Young. So Helen, really quickly, because um, when you got this, I, I just want to say like you worked in a place that you were totally supported in terms of you had all the staff and you just had to do the story. So at some point you decide to make this film, but you're also now on your own. So you create your own production company. What's it like to um, pull it together that way and not and like <laughs> you like you were used to having everybody like, oh, oh, they're gonna just give me a cameraman. Oh, so you don't have to talk about all the team because I'll ask a question about that later, but how was that to shift and like kind of pull up your big girl pants and have to find right. everything yourself, so to speak? What was that like for you? Well, it, it, it was positive and negative. Positive on the side that I really always wanted to do it. I, I wanted to make my own film um, and it would be something that I could mold myself. Uh, on the negative side, it's very tough because you only have yourself to account to. <laughs> and so, yeah, it, it was a big challenge. Um, but uh, I was very fortunate. I, I got interns from the various universities around mm -hmm. and uh, a wonderful uh, number of editors who worked with me. And the key thing was that I think I found a great story. So that's what really, you know, mm -hmm. for me, it's all about the story. Um, and uh, once I decided that I was going to do it, then it was just a matter. I never thought I would ever have to do a crowdsourcing campaign, but that's another thing that is currently happening mm -hmm. and, and people are raising money to make films and I ended up having to do that. Uh, and so it, it did take a long time. And I you didn't... learn a lot of skills you probably never thought you'd ever yeah. have to learn beyond filmmaking. It's like mm -hmm. the you have to learn the marketing, the you know, all the logistics, and you probably have to you know schedule your you know the screenings and the right. travel and anyway we're not going to get into all that but let's talk about this really remarkable film. I'm just going to read and you can fill in the rest a little bit about the background of it. I mean not the background, just a little. Um, I just like it because it's got nuns and priests, and I was raised, I had family that were nuns and priests, and I have a film about nuns, so. Um, the film tells the story of a community of nuclear, uh, I'm sorry, of a community of nuclear disarmament activists who are willing to endure a long prison sentence and even risk death because of their deeply held convictions on nuclear weapons that are, they are immoral and illegal. And also they're just, I love it like in the film that just humanity like in the Bible and none of this is supposed to happen you're supposed to be you know we're not supposed to be making it so people can't be alive um, that, that's a part in the film that really gets to me when the sister talks about that the film also follows the efforts of the United Nations and negotiations and new treaties that prohibit the use uh, of threat of the use I'm sorry the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons but really it's about um, I just want to say the the first title was the Banger Five, and it has to do with two nuns, two priests, or a priest and two um, lay people. That and I'm gonna let Helen tell you the rest because they go to Banger, and but then there's really the story before that, the Y12. So there's a lot of pe a lot of religious people and people that are want to show how potentially dangerous all these stores of nuclear weapons are and how easy it is for someone who doesn't know anything to get access to them, which that makes it really scary because it could annihilate the whole world. And so I'm gonna let you take it away from there. Right, well the film actually follows two different cases, two yes. different federal cases that um, 
focused on two actions, uh, and, and, it, and it looks at the Plowshares Movement. Yeah, I, I wanted I, you to talk so about Plowshares. So the Plowshares Movement was a movement started in 1980 by the Berrigan brothers, oh, yes, Phil and Dan, Dan Berrigan, Dan. who yeah. were well known for opposing the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they started this international movement to protest nuclear weapons, and basically they undertake actions where they trespass onto nuclear weapons facilities carrying carpenter hammers and vials of their own blood. Uh, they carry the hammers to symbolically disarm the weapons, mm -hmm. and they use the blood, which As they a pour. For forgiveness. Yeah, well, they use they pour their own blood on the weapons as a sign that enough blood has been spilled mm -hmm. already. Um, these are symbolic acts. Mm -hmm. Now, I had heard of the plowshares before. Um, I became interested in the story. I originally was going to call the film The Bangor Five. I heard about this case really back in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, five people, including a nun who was 84 and two Jesuit priests, one of whom was 82, and two grandmothers mm -hmm. were able to trespass into the Kitsap Bangor Naval Base mm -hmm. in um, Bangor, Washington, which is about 20 miles from Seattle. Uh, these people were able to get into this base, which is considered one of the most secure bases in the country because mm -hmm. it has the largest stockpile of operational nuclear warheads in the country. Mm -hmm. And it has eight Trident nuclear submarines. They were able to get in using some bolt cutters. Mm -hmm. and they were able to roam around the base. They were there for like an hour or something. Well, they say four hours. Four hours. Okay, I thought <laughs> I read something about so, an hour. Yeah. So the story was pretty uh, unbelievable that these, this ragtag team was able to get into this fortress-like area. And I just thought it was an incredible story. And when I heard about it, um, I decided to jump on it. Um, what had happened as I was making the film, in the course of making it, about a year into it, um, a friend of mine called me, it was in July of 2012, and said, have you read, have you seen the front page of the New York Times today? And I said, no, I hadn't seen it yet. I ran to the paper and there on the front page was a picture of a Catholic nun who had broken into another nuclear weapons facility and I thought, oh my goodness, is this my story? It was actually another incident that had happened with uh, Sister Megan Rice and two other Rice. activists who had broken that into- That was the Y-12 one? Y-12 mm -hmm. in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And so my film looks at these two cases, but there's an interesting link between them. And it's really at the heart of the film, it is a friendship between two Catholic nuns, one who inspired the other to act. And so um, it's really a human story. It's, it's a personal story. And in my journey of researching nuclear weapons, uh, it took me a long time to really understand the issue. It's a very complicated one. Mm -hmm. It's a very political one also. Um, what, I, what I was finding was a lot of research on uh, military and strategic and geopolitical facts. But I really wanted to explore, to put a human face on this, on this issue and to explore the human and, um, I mean, the, the moral and legal and ethical components of, mm -hmm. of this uh, issue. And I, I think I found it in this film because it, it, it tells their story, but it also interweaves information about nuclear weapons. And I think um, one of my objectives in the film is to try to educate and enlighten people on really these horrific weapons, which are, Many, many times more powerful than the weapon dropped on Hiroshima. The weapons dropped on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. We know what that did. So, yeah. should we look at the part of the clip? We sure. have a clip from the trailer. So, let's see that now, Yell, if you can bring it to us. It'd be great. We must ensure the terrorists never acquire a nuclear weapon. This is the most immediate and extreme threat to global security. Mr. Megan, you've not disputed the fact that you breached security at Oak Ridge. We don't consider it a breach of security. We were doing what every moral and international law says must be done. The laws of humanity. You can't go breaking into a federal facility because you believe you're protecting the future of the planet. We were convinced. 
evidence that we were saving lives. They cut through fences, breached security. They made it all the way to the nuclear weapons bunkers. Two priests, a nun, and two fellow activists, all ranging in age from 61 to 84. We did it to bring to light the illegality and immorality of these weapons. Blood would not coagulate and ooze through unbroken skin. This is the Hiroshima bomb. This is the Trident bomb. It is the most powerful weapon in the possession of human beings today. There's no comparison. 1.6 million fatalities, about 2.4 million injuries. Attention must be paid. And uh, it's not being paid. Amen. Amen. It's a, and you must see this movie. It's a must. And it's interesting, too, because I read something today that, fa I'm going to call him Father Bixel. How do you say his name? Bixel. Father Bixel. Yeah. Bixel. This, you say, is kind of like, because he passed before right. the film was finished, and it really is like a testament to the way he lived his life. And I also like that he really lived his life like Gandhi uh, said, be the change. And all these people to be the change. So, um, by the way, it's interesting you bring up Gandhi in well, you uh, relation to, to yeah, to one minute. one minute, okay, in relation to Father Bix because he is considered Tacoma's Mahatma Gandhi. Oh wow! And he really was. Um, he was very encouraging to me to finish the film because we had a lot of challenges along the way. And I, I do feel uh, that uh, it's it's sad that he's not here, but I know that he that he's happy he's somewhere. He's here, either. <laughs> right. So we have probably about thirty seconds, Helen. Right. So anything you, else you want to say about the film, like where people might be able to? You could probably follow your website to see where it will be. But there are screenings. Um, people could get in touch with you and create screenings for churches or organizations, I'm sure, too. Um, right. We are rolling the film out at colleges. We have mm -hmm. sh shown it at a number Notre of... Notre Dame. And George Washington places. University, Naropa University. We have uh, some upcoming screenings at uh, uh, Brown and uh, Loyola mm -hmm. and uh, Fordham and a couple of other places. Uh, yes, uh, please follow the web page mm -hmm. and uh, you can get in touch with me to organize a screening and um, we will soon have it online so be great thank you so much for thank coming you Helen. and I wish we had more thank time, you we appreciate about it. it all i think okay. yeah great thank, thank you. you oh there go the credits well why they're running does was there did the story like take its own direction a little bit because i feel like my you know you got more of a direction when you're in the middle of it did it feel like that sometime well, actually, the story morphed <laughs> because I started, you know, with the people out on the West Coast, and then this other case happened, and I had to figure out was I going to take that other case or not, and I ended up deciding that uh, I would. And yeah, I mean, it took a different direction because I actually went with Father Bix to Norway. I thought I was going to saw that. That's yeah, great. yeah. I think we're out now, but I wanted to see Thank if 